Um, at First Parish, our services are 90 minutes, so just going to put that out there. Hopefully, we will <laughs> not keep you too long. Um, so my, my mentor in ministry has always told me that church is a place to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> I am fat. I use the F word to describe myself because I just am. And the responses to using this three-letter word are pretty diverse. From looks of horror to awkward giggling. But my favorite reaction, my favorite reaction is when someone immediately says, no, you're not. <laughs> really? <laughs> It makes no sense, but somehow in this world of war and famine and the rise of dictators, our culture has led us to believe that the worst thing we can be is fat. We have demonized the word fat to the point that people would rather look at me and say, you're not fat, than agree with what should be a morally neutral fact about my body. In, re in reality, what I believe they are saying is that you are not lazy or ugly or stupid or lacking self-discipline or self-control or have less competency than the people around you because those are the things that we see in fat people. If asked, the most hateful online troll or over-eager personal trainer, they would never admit to hating the person under the fat Instead, it's the fat itself that is to be hated, feared, and controlled. It's the all-too-familiar, love the sinner, hate the sin refrain that can be heard in Christian churches. Ask any gay person who has attended a church that proclaims to be welcoming, but is not fully open and affirming. You are welcome here among us, and we know that you are, in, but we know that you are inherently flawed, and only through Change and repentance will you be seen as a good and whole person. Thank God the LGBTQ plus, QIA plus community has rejected this paternalism and made or found church spaces for ourselves, aided by our allies. And now it's time for fat people of faith and our allies to do the same soul work so we can realize that no matter what shape our body is in, we all understand that we are good and whole and entitled to the same treatment and dignity and space as everyone else. In her book, Fat Church, Anastasia Kidd welcomes us to join an anti-paternalism party, a party where we break the love the sinner, hate the sin of fatness pinata and redistribute the sweetness inside to all bodies who need to eat some candy and not feel guilty about it. She invites people who struggle with their weight, whatever form that takes, come rest, friends, she says, and take a break from the idea that you need to lose a part of yourself to feel good enough. Next, she invites people who feel sinful, unhealthy, or out of control because of their body shape. Come to the party, pick up a cocktail, and rest in the idea that you never need to count another calorie, ketone, or point again. And if that thought is making you all anxious, don't worry. There's a long list of fat activists, writers, and researchers creating a community around you. Next on the invite list to this party are those whose bodies are deemed other in society. Disabled bodies, black bodies, anyone that doesn't fit into the imaginary mold. Because my liberation is wound up in your liberation. And finally, on the invite list to this party of freedom are all of us who have a body. Because weight stigma, believe it or not, affects all of us. We live in a culture of thin inspiration. Think about TV shows like The Biggest Loser, My 600 Pound Life. Our society spends billions of dollars to ensure that we equate fatness with laziness gluttony, stupidity, unhappiness, and untimely death, regardless of the fact that there is no conclusive research evidence to support these stereotypes. We moralize language around food by giving it names like good, bad,
bad and naughty. I would love to find and eat a naughty cookie. Like, what did this cookie do? Take up too much room in the pan and smush the other cookies? I don't know. But we spend billions of dollars on diets and programs that use the calorific equivalent of starvation. And then those programs berate us because we don't have the willpower to starve for more than a couple of months. In short, my friends, we are bombarded with messaging that anything other than the small percent of people on this planet who have the ideal, I guess, bodies are not good enough. And so we joke and punish and shame each other and ourselves. We starve ourselves relentlessly on a never-ending carousel of striving for something that is not achievable. The staggering statistic is that only 3% of people who lose weight sustain that weight loss long-term. The rest of us, we're just supposed to feel crappy about the pizza we ate at family movie night and invest more time and money and mental effort to rid ourselves of all those cheesy, gooey calories. So pull up a sturdy, arm-free armchair, my friends, and join me in this party of fat liberation. Even if you think that fatphobic injustice does not affect you, I promise you it does. I know because of 42 years of living in this deemed by the unmedically, unmedical scale of BMI as morbidly obese body, some of me, you may think this all just seems like a way to justify being fat, that I am too lazy with no self-control to diet. So instead, I will create fat liberation. I get it, I do, I'm not mad. I know that's how our society programs us all to think about our bodies. I've gone there on occasion too. But what I want to ask of you for the next five minutes, just put those thoughts down beside you, settle into your more than good enough body and hear my story. Because I believe if fat people don't tell their personal stories, it plays right into the mindset of it's not the person, but the fat that is the problem. But I am my fat, that is who I am. And I am not a problem most of the time. I have, however, suffered at the hands of the anti-fat bias of medical providers. Someone who has been asked at a pain clinic if I knew what an avocado was. I too have a bit of a sarky response. And I, I just couldn't help replying, oh, an avocado? I think we had a tree of those in our backyard in Zimbabwe. I'm the person who has, who has to witness friends a third of my size complaining about how fat they are, how awful that is, how they are so ashamed and embarrassed and repulsed by their ugly selves. Usually I say, if you feel that way about your body, what on earth do you think of mine? Oh, no, no, you're not fat. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I am the person who's been admired because of my achievements, despite my weight. And I am the person who wants to be recognized for who I am, regardless of my size. Growing up, I was always outside riding my bike. I volunteered at the local riding stables. I had an activity every night of the week, and I never slowed down in this morbidly obese body. My sister stayed in, read books, watched TV. She had a small body. I remember distinctly my mother saying at a doctor's appointment that it seems unfair that I am the fat sister because I am the busy, active child. Don't get me wrong, I am not trying to show you that I was a good fat person who is active and exercises, but I say this because I remember trying to figure out what was unfair about being fat. The fact that my sister always got her way on Friday nights at Blockbuster with which VH tape we were going to rent that was unfair, but my body, it was so confusing, especially as I was raised by two parents who had their own struggles, as we all do, but who very much marched to their own beat. They did not conform to gender roles. My dad was the nurturer, my mom the breadwinner. I was not subjected to yo-yo diets or body shame in my house. We were raised to not care what people thought about us. So why, why was my body unfair? I loved my wild life. And so I sort of didn't realize I was fat, or more accurately, that fat was apparently a problem. It was just me living life, wearing bathing suits on the beach with wild abandon. And I use that example because I work with teen girls at residential summer camps, and the number of girls who lost out on waterfront activities just childhood fun 
because of their insecurity around their bodies was painful. I was bullied pretty harshly, but I sort of figured it was because I was a bit weird and I just found ways to constantly be living my best life anyway, not doing what typical teens were doing. But I always had friends, I was always involved in everything and a leader in many things. As a child and teenager, I never really paid much heed to my body size. I took part in things that society say are hobbies, not for the fat. And my jobs were all outdoor based. I trained as a park ranger, I was a farmer, I was the student president of my college. Oh, I was also vegan for 20 years. Believe it or not, vegans can be morbidly obese too. But now, with the realization of how disregarded my body is and how I am viewed by fat bias, I sometimes look back at that life and wonder what was going on in the heads of the people around me. A morbid obese ranger, a dairy herder, a college student president and valedictorian? How can this be? Because fat people are lazy, unhealthy, stupid, without self-discipline and gluttonous, remember? At age 20, after working three jobs for six months, I took off on a solo backpacking adventure around the world. Long, long, long story short, I ended up working for the YMCA overnight camp here on Cape Cod. First as a camp counselor and then outdoor educator, and then as the farm director. I was surrounded by outdoorsy, rock climbing, hiking, campy type folks, because I was one. And one day I was belaying a student on our climbing wall, and after the session ended and I packed up the harnesses, ropes, and climbing tower, a teacher pulled me aside and said, we have a student who is like you, and I think it's so great for her to see you doing this job. She has no self-confidence. What a role model you are. And I wanted to say, like me how? Hilarious? But I knew exactly what he was talking about. My fat. And I remember canoeing home that night across the camp pond and feeling my world shift in a sizable way. The aha moment that people view me as a fat person first and foremost. And in viewing me that way, they either A, put all the stereotypes of fat people on me, or B, view me as a role model based on doing normal things, but in a morbidly obese body. Like that is some sort of miracle. And that was the day I started my journey of fat liberation. The greatest hurdle to fat, fat acceptance in our culture is overcoming the myths that fat bodies can become thin bodies if only we have willpower, and that fat equals bad health. This is where we get stuck. And this is how we decide people with fat bodies are lazy and not cooperative in their own health and well-being. Despite the fact that there are obese marathon runners and thin marathon runners, thin people and fat people with high cholesterol, thin people and fat people in chronic pain, people of all shapes and sizes, with all sorts of the same illnesses. Excuse me. <laughs> but here's the problem. If you are in a straight sized body, then you will be treated very differently by the medical system than if you're in an obese body. I walked around with a dislocated joint for over a year, a dislocated joint, which went undiagnosed and I was just given month after month of narcotics and told that the solution to this pain would be losing weight. The doctor could not see past my fat, didn't do the right testing, and just decided it was random fat pain, which is not even a thing. <laughs> Can you imagine being left with a dislocated joint and the pain of that for a year? That's when I was asked if I knew what an avocado was, and that's when I knew that I was on my own journey with this pain. When I meet a new medical provider, they're always visibly shocked when they take my blood pressure and it's normal. Really, like, oh, your blood pressure is normal. Oh, you don't have diabetes? And it's such a surprising thing to them. Have any of you in straight-sized bodies ever had a care provider look shocked and surprised when you had normal blood pressure? Probably not. Fat phobia promotes discriminatory stereotypes. It also impacts people in bodies of all sizes, serving to further reinforce negative beliefs. Because if people like me are unacceptable, then the priority becomes avoidance at any cost, which leads to eating disorders, exercise-based injuries, and folks in all sorts of body si sizes committing suicide because they'd rather be dead than fat. 
I'm going to say that again. Young people who are either bullied about their size or feel so bad about their body, often with body dysmorphia, are killing themselves because of a few pounds of fat and the standards that our society is portraying to them how we all should be. That's how powerful the diet and beauty industry has been in convincing us that fatness is the worst. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of all people, and there is a fat UU minister who was told they would not be able to leave seminary and find a settled ministry unless they lost some weight. A Unitarian Universalist minister. And it is our responsibility to combat anti-fat bias just as it is to combat racism, sexism, disability prejudice, and all the other injustices in our world. It's just that fat prejudice is so ingrained in us, we don't even realize it's there. We don't realize that saying you look so good to someone who has lost weight is causing harm. My hope is that by hearing the message of a fat, professional religious educator, who is also an avid cycler and swimmer, with perfect cholesterol, good blood pressure, and no diabetes, will open you up a little to understanding that fat phobia and the stereotypes around it have widespread consequences in our communities. And at least let you dip your toe into the fact that obesity might not be everything you have been led to believe it is. My invitation is that you will listen to the stories of people in all sorts of bodies with all sorts of medical diagnoses so that we can start unraveling this overwhelming oppression. Think about having a dislocated joint and not being treated based on your body. I wish I had another couple of hours to unpack some more of the myths about our bodies, but for now, I leave you with one last passage from Fat Church by Anastasia Kidd. America, it seems, has a big fat problem, or at least this is what I thought when writing this book. Like many people, I believe that America's growing weight was a genuine health quandary. My initial plan for this book was to look at why America was gaining weight and what we could do to stop it. As I researched, the more misguided I realized my assumptions about obesity were. What I came to realize is that obesity is not a problem because 60% of Americans are obese or that there are these hundreds and thousands of obese people dying from being too fat or because it costs hundreds and billions in healthcare because none of these things the new research is finding are true. We believe they are. We have been told that story. It's going to take a long time to unpack it and believe it. But obesity is only a problem because of the unholy trinity of diet, beauty, and medical industries. A sermon for another day. And so, my friends, my invitation to you today is for you to live into our UU values. Do some research. Question what you think you know about obese bodies, fat bodies, your own body. Look inside yourself at the fat bias in your own self. We all have it, myself included, and in the world around you. Please stop offering weight loss advice to people in big bodies. Stop shaming yourself for eating a slice of cake. Damn, stop shaming yourself if you eat the whole cake. We all do on occasion. <laughs> and mostly, do the work of our faith, the work of liberation. And whilst doing that work, please enjoy the Fat Liberation Party. Everyone belongs here because all of our glorious bodies we are, are all worthy of celebration and love. Thank you so much, Twinks. I'm so grateful for your courage in telling your story. <laughs> <laughs>